All right. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us. I'm Corey Mabry, Director of IEC MRI Accreditation, and I'm joined by Dr. David Jordan, Secretary of the IEC MRI Board of Directors. The focus of this webcast will be the preventative maintenance and the annual quality control assessments that are required by the IAC MRI standards. The topics that we'll be covering today are the benefits of quality control, um, known as QC uh, assessments, which assessments are required, how often do they need to be performed, and how to document them. All right, we're gonna start out with, with some of the benefits of, of equipment uh, QC. Dr. Jordan, are you able to tell us a, a bit more about the, the benefits of uh, equipment QC? Yes. So your quality control program for your MRI equipment has, it's the centerpiece of your efforts to maintain high quality diagnostic imaging as well as patient safety for your facility. So this is a structured set of assessments that looks at um, your basic uh, patient safety devices, make sure that they're working properly before you need them. And it also is a way to monitor performance characteristics of your equipment. The idea here is to try to identify any kind of degradations in performance or anything that's coming in need of repair or adjustment before it reaches the point that it's gonna compromise your clinical image quality and your diagnostic capability so that you can get those things fixed proactively and maintain high quality imaging and high quality patient care at all times continuously. Great, great. Thank you, Dr. Jordan. Next, we are going to dive a little deeper uh, into the assessments themselves, and, and we're going to start out with, with the radio frequency coil assessments. Um, now, Dr. Jordan, what must be assessed in terms of the physical visual inspection of the coils, what specific items must be evaluated? So we have the required evaluations uh, listed here on the slide, and these are taken from the IAC MRI accreditation program standards. These are widely accepted practices that are found in uh, medical physics and medical imaging uh, practice guidelines and technical standards that you'll find published by a number of, of uh, leading national and international organizations. These are also gonna be the same assessments that your MRI equipment service team is gonna to wanna to use to monitor the performance of the system and to determine uh, when it needs any adjustments or repairs. So we would always lead off with um, just, a, just an eyeball inspection. So you wanna look at each of these coils. These things are you know, taken on and off of the patient table plugged into the system and unplugged, you know, many, many times throughout every working day. So you're looking for wear and tear and any kind of physical damage that might, uh, that might be hiding uh, damage to the functional components inside of the casing. Uh, so any kind of, you know, cuts or tears or cracks in the cable insulation, any kind of signs of vis visible damage, you'll want to have those uh, identified and, and handled. Then there are a number of performance parameters uh, that need to be monitored to maintain uh, continuous performance of the coil and keep it working within the manufacturer's design guidelines. So with each scan, your system will determine uh, the required radio frequency transmitter gain and it will, it will determine the appropriate receiver attenuator values. These values should be consistent over time. And so this is something that needs to be tested periodically using a reproducible setup, same phantom, same scan sequence. And if the coil is working properly, those numbers should be consistent over time. Your signal to noise ratio is measured from the images themselves. So this is your true sort of end to end test of the coil. It's hooked up to the system. It runs a, uh, an imaging sequence, which is the same each time you do this test. And then this measurement will tell you whether the coil is collecting the expected amount of signal, whether it's collecting the expected amount of noise. And again, these values should be consistent over time and they should fall within a specification to tell you whether this test passed or failed. Certain MRI coils are designed to produce a uniform signal throughout the entire volume that they can image. So these are your volume coils like your birdcage head coils, many of your uh, extremity coils, knee coils, and things like that fall into this category. So for those coils, they need to have a numerical assessment of the image uniformity. This is another factor that's going to tell you whether or not that coil is working properly. Now, there are lots of coils on your MRI scanner that are not designed 
to be uniform. They're going to have characteristic hot spots and cold spots. So a, an example of this would be a spine coil that produces a high signal close to the coil. You would expect that signal to not be as strong as you move away from the coil surface. So for those coils, we want to see a visual assessment that the pattern of the coil signal is what it's supposed to be, even if it's not particularly uniform. And then lastly, but also critically, we'd like to see an artifact assessment for each coil. And this can be a simple visual assessment, you know, no artifacts present or you know, a notation of any artifacts that are observed. And as you know, from your experience in MRI, there are a wide variety of artifacts you can see. So we're looking for this to be assessed visually um, during the test scans that you're doing to assess signal to noise ratio, uniformity and things like that. And again, any artifacts that show up during the test they should be noted, described what they are, and your facility should be taking steps to have your, your service team troubleshoot and resolve those artifacts. Excellent, thank you. That does excellent uh, information, Dr. Jordan. Um, so now that now that we've gone over the, the QC for the, the RF coils, let's talk about a bit about the, the system assessments. Um, and you know, as you can see here, the, the first uh, few uh, are pretty routine, uh, but but Dr. Jordan, uh, in terms of the the system artifact assessment, what should be evaluated, and how is this different than the coil artifact assessments that you were just telling us about? Well, your system artifact assessment is is sort of related to your individual coil artifact assessment. So every every image that you acquire uh, is is acquired with a coil. So at the system level, there are some artifacts which you may see consistently across several coils or across all of your coils. So when it comes time to assess any artifacts that you're seeing, your system artifact assessment should, should reflect whether you're seeing artifacts that are specific to individual coils or whether you're seeing artifacts that might reflect some type of a system level problem with the magnet, with the transmitter, with the RF shielding enclosure or something like that. So it's, it's not a separate test per se, but in your evaluation report, your performance report, your, your preventative maintenance report, you'd like to see a specific diagnosis to say, these artifacts that we're trying to troubleshoot are isolated to an individual coil or group of coils, or these are system level problems that are being assessed through something like adjusting the magnet shim or troubleshooting the, uh, the RF shield or something of that nature. Great, great, thanks. Now, um, what about the, the general equipment in inspection? Now, I'm gonna guess that that probably includes uh, an assessment of the radio frequency shielding, you know, the monitor. What else should be evaluated? What are the other items to, to take a closer look at? So this is the, this is the, um, the technologist gut check, really. So this, um, what I always tell technologists is that when you walk into your room and you walk around your scanner, you know how things are supposed to be. So this is a checklist that should jog your memory or jog your thinking about all the things that you want to look at. Look at everything from, is the room too hot or too cold? Does it feel too humid? You know, some evidence that there's something wrong with your climate control. Um, do the does the door open and close the way it's supposed to uh, as you operate the mechanical components of the system, as you drive the patient table in and out of the magnet? Uh, does anything make any noises that it doesn't normally make, any grinding or squeaking or anything like that? Uh, do things that are supposed to move smoothly, do they move smoothly? Uh, do buttons push? Do lights light? Do switches switch? You know, all of these kinds of things that you will notice them in the course of your everyday work. They will become annoying to you if they don't work. But part of the pro part of the reason that we have this process in place and that we have an explicit checklist laid out is that many of us know that when you run across these little nagging problems, you come up with workarounds and you continue on about your business. So having a, a checklist laid out to remind you, oh yeah, you know, I'm supposed to check off here that you know, all of my indicator lights work, but I know that there's this one that's burned out. It's just that extra prompt to, to sort of shake you out of that, that routine that you fall into and, you know, prompt you to, to get that issue taken care of, get that issue addressed. Because even if it's a small, you know, convenience item or it seems like a small annoyance, um, you never know when that could get you into trouble. Okay, excellent. Thank you, thank you. Um, 
Next, uh, let, let's discuss, you know, how often the, the QC needs to be done. Now, since the focus of this webcast was periodic QC, I've omitted the, the daily operator QC assessments that must be performed, you know, uh, for the sake of redundancy, they're, they're, they're to be performed daily or, you know, each day that the magnet is in use. Um, but beyond the daily assessments, the PM uh, or preventative maintenance, also known as the PM, uh, performed by the service engineer must occur at the, the frequency that's specified by the manufacturer, but not less than once a year. Also, a recent revision of the IAC MRI standards, um, effective November 15th, allows, um, November 15th, 2020, allows a medical physicist to perform an annual QC assessment. As a result of, of the standards being revised, the IAC MRI accreditation application has also been updated to allow the submission of the medical physicist annual QC in addition to or in place of the engineer's PM. So the takeaway is that a PM or an in-depth QC assessment must occur at a minimum of once per year. A service engineer or a medical physicist may do the annual QC. Next, you may be wondering how to record the assessments that we've been discussing. Uh, most engineers and, and, and medical physicists probably have their own template uh, for the, the PM report, annual QC surveys. And, and, you know, these are acceptable as long as, you know, they contain the items that we've been discussing, uh, the assessments, the results in terms of pass or fail, as well as the measured values and the reference ranges. Um, now, for those that are interested, uh, IAC has provided this template that we're, that we're looking at here. Um, it may be a good idea, or it, or it is a good idea, rather, to review this document with, with your facility's service engineer or um, your facility's medical physicist to ensure that everything listed on this, uh, this document, with a few exceptions, which I'll tell you about soon, are included in the PM or the annual uh, QC survey report. Um, and I, I've even seen some facilities include uh, this document to supplement their PM or annual survey report that's been provided by the, the engineer or medical physicist. Now, something to keep in mind, um, when this document was created, um, assessments were actually included that are above and beyond those that were, are required by the IAC MRI standards. And the reason that this was done is we tried to, to capture uh, most of the, the routine assessments that are typically performed during the PMs and the annual surveys. And if you notice, the additional assessments are indicated with a red asterisk here. So now that we've gone over the assessments that need to be done, how often they need to be done, and who does them, Let's talk a bit about some of the issues that have been encountered with the PMs and annual QC survey reports. Dr. Jordan, do you have any uh, insights to share uh, regarding these? Yes, and I'll say, you know, part of this is um, the IAC standards allow some flexibility in the way that facilities do this. And Corey, as you pointed out, the, the annual preventative maintenance and the annual quality control assessment um, in many cases, those are part of a larger program that's carried out by a service engineer, or those may be two separate components, um, you know, similar to your car. So your preventative maintenance would involve things like changing your oil and checking your <clears throat> tire treads and brake pad wear and things like that. Um, we don't do something like an annual QC assessment on our cars, but if we did, uh, we might have an expert mechanic take the car for a test drive and verify that it accelerates the way it's supposed to, verify that it can brake from a certain speed over a certain distance, verify that the speedometer is accurate by using an independent GPS, things like that. So all of that is, is done once a year, and that can be done by the service engineer, or it can be separated into a service engineer portion and a physicist portion. With the flexibility in the standards, the, the good news is that this allows us to accept 
uh, work that's done by service engineers from a variety of different companies, uh, physicists from a variety of different groups who, who organize things differently. But the key to all of this is that the documentation has to show that it satisfies the requirements in the standard. So our reviewers are going to look very carefully to see if they can find anything that fits in with the standards. Um, it can be challenging in some cases where the terminology is different. So if there's a if there's a test or an assessment in the standards and it's referred to by a different name um, by the by the person who's creating the report for you, we're going to do our best to figure that out. We're going to try to give you the benefit of the doubt to say, you know, we think we know what they did here. But if there are things that are just not listed or don't appear in the documentation and we have no way of knowing for sure whether those tests were done, IAC is going to ask for additional documentation to establish that. Another difficulty that we run into is with things like signal to noise ratio measurements, where we know that those tests inherently produce a number and that that number is compared to a range to say this is the required value. And if it falls within this range, it passes. If it doesn't, it fails. Um, and in many cases, we will see documentation that simply has a check mark or it'll say OK or pass. But it doesn't tell us anything about what that measurement was or what the what the applicable range was. So we want to see that there is a specific standard that's being applied um, and that that standard comes from either you know, a manufacturer's documentation or from documentation from a physicist performing the test to say this is how we judged it to be a pass. And so you know, these are a couple of related issues where we'll see just an okay or a pass, or we'll see 129, but we won't have any indication of whether 129 is good, great, or terrible. Um, and then of course, in looking at the individual RF coils, because those are sort of the, the, the key interface for the signal coming from the patient getting into the system, of course we need to have all those system level tests, but it is quite frequent where we will see a report that addresses system level maintenance and system level uh, performance, but there's no indication of those performance checks or those visual inspections for each of those individual coils. And because those are a critical link in the chain, we really do need to see that those are all being evaluated and where appropriate, those are being serviced. Excellent, thank you for that. Alrighty, so um, thank you again for, for joining us for this webcast. Uh, feel free to contact IAC with any questions. We look forward to hearing from you.